Good evening, everybody. My name is Callum. Welcome to night of Real Lives 2019. Real Lives is put on by Above Bar Church, and it's an opportunity to hear people's um, stories, their perspective, their expertise, and how that intertwines with their faith. And um, tonight, there will be a Q&A at the end, and there are pieces of paper and pens on most every table, and there's also a lovely kind of Cuban-looking hat. So if you have a question you would like uh, Dr. Dirks to answer during the Q&A, please write down your question and please make it l readable and uh, fairly brief, um, no four score and 20 years kind of you know, speeches, and put it in the hat after this interview, and then we'll have about 20 minutes of Dr. Derek's answering your questions. So, uh, tonight uh, is our night focused on science, and scientists also believe in God. And we have uh, Dr. Sharon Derek's. Um, Sharon is a, a, uh, an apologist, a, a speaker with the Oxford Center for Christian Apologetics, and her doctorate is in brain imaging science from... Um, a little university called Cambridge. And um, it is so wonderful to, to have you here. Thank you so much for coming. Can we give uh, her a round of applause? <laughs> this is especially exciting for me because I actually studied Erin uh, for a year. So it's my first time to actually grill her back, um, which is great. Great. Um, Sharon, thank you so much for, for being here. Um, Growing up as a little girl, did you want, always dream, to have a doctorate in brain imaging science? Or was that something that developed later? I'd say as a little girl, um, I probably wasn't thinking that uh, thing. It was around um, the age of about 13 or 14, I decided that I already knew that I loved the sciences. I always did my science homework first in secondary school and maths. and and really steered myself away from the humanities and got fairly stressed about English and history and all of those things. Um, and so I knew then that I wanted to... Um, I loved the idea of digging deep into a, into a subject and really um, uh, mining it for information. <coughs> and I loved studying the natural world. So as a teenager, I think. And yeah. just a quick question about your name. <coughs> Dirix, I think I'm saying it right. That's right. Yeah, yeah. It's difficult uh, to, to get right, though. What, what kind of name is that? Where did the name Dirks come from? Yeah, it's Dutch. Uh, my husband is half Dutch. We met in a brain imaging lab. How uh, romantic is that? Um, and uh, one of the first things I ever said to him was that I didn't think there were enough vowels in his last name. And uh, little did I know that it would end up becoming my own name. Um, but yeah, you pronounce it Dirks as in lyrics and it's Dutch. It's normal for, for Holland. If you're in Holland, they have no problems with how to pronounce it. It's only on this side of the English Channel that we, we run into trouble. And you, you speak with and you, you teach at the Oxford Centre for Christian Apologetics. Could you explain a bit what, what is apologetics? Yeah. Well, this Oxford Centre is a centre where we are trying to um, respond to the cultural questions of our day. <clears throat> and it's a Christian center, and we're trying to show that, you know, if, if God is real, and if the person of Jesus Christ is who he said he is, then there are, um, there are answers that stack up and that hold water even when we ask life's hardest questions of it. And so we are trying to respond to the questions that people have today, questions like this one, has science disproved God? What are we as human beings? Um, questions like, why would God allow suffering if he exists? Questions like, well, why, why Jesus? You know, why not uh, all of the other options? And so, um, so we are trying to both respond to those ourselves in evenings like this, and we are training um, people to respond to those questions. And Callum is one of the um, students that came out of the, the center a few years ago. So They're not all that it's, yeah. So um, an apologetics is kind of um, giving reasons for why you believe we believe what we believe. There's a verse in the New Testament that says, um, always be ready to give an answer for the reason, for the hope that you have. 
but do this with gentleness and respect, keeping a clear conscience. And the, the Greek word for um, answer, given answer, is apologia, and that's where we get apologetics from. It doesn't primarily mean apologizing, although it might involve apologizing along the way, but it, it means kind of giving reasons for why we believe what we believe. And have you, have you always... <coughs> that's delightful. Have you always worked as an apologist, or have you always been there in Oxford? Um, no. So I, um, my love of science continued, and it took me to studying um, biochemistry just um, down the road at Bristol University um, in the 1990s. And um, I continued in science. I, I moved into brain imaging for my doctorate, and I continued in uh, brain imaging for another 10 or so years after that. And, and then it was shortly after that that I moved into studying apologetics myself and then working in this area. And just give us a brief idea. I mean, brain imaging, what does that exactly mean, include? Yeah, so you maybe have all heard of MRI. Um, you might have heard of it in terms of going for a knee scan or maybe a, a brain scan where you're looking at the... You go into what looks like a giant toilet roll um, and um, you sit there while it makes some loud clanking noises. Um, and what comes out is a picture of your brain or your knee or your shoulder or whatever it is that you're, they're looking at. And what's amazing about this technique and others like it is that they, before um, brain imaging techniques were here, People, um, scientists, if they wanted to study the human brain, they were limited to people with awful diseases or post-mortem studies of those that had already died. But what these techniques enabled is for scientists to look inside the brains of healthy people because it doesn't cut into the brain. And so it really changed the landscape of neuroscience um, a few decades ago. And, um, and so what, what I have... Um, been, been using those techniques to look at is, well, uh, methodology in terms of like, if you put someone, it's not very interesting actually, what someone does for their PhD, honestly, you really, it's not, not terribly interesting, but I looked at the, the methodology of like, well, what kind of signal do you get out if you put these parameters in? And I was looking at um, not just the structure of the human brain, but its function, um, because um, there, there's a technique called functional MRI, which is looking at brain activity. So you put someone in a scanner and you give them an activity to do. And um, basically you can analyze that data and look at the brain regions that were active when they were doing that particular activity. You have to design the experiment very well. But uh, that's, yeah, that's what I was doing. Wow. Sounds like definitely something I would avoid. And... Um, you have you always been a Christian? Did you grow up in a Christian home, that kind of thing? Grow, going to church? Yeah, no, I didn't at all. I, I I went to church maybe a handful of times as a child, um, and I remember being like kicked out of a Sunday school at the age of like six or seven. I, I was um, a bit of a rebel, I guess. Um, I I grew up in a home that I I best describe as sort of very loving but religiously neutral. There was there was just nothing of a religious nature. Um, and, and actually what, what happened was, because I knew that I loved sciences, I ended up um, really admiring my A-level biology teacher. And she um, gave me a copy or recommended that I read this book called Rich, uh, by Richard Dawkins called The Selfish Gene. And I remember really pondering this view that we are essentially biological machines controlled by our DNA. And I sort of took that view and absorbed that view um, that we are machines, that the natural world is all that there is. And I took that view with me to Bristol when I arrived there to study biochemistry. So I, I haven't always been a Christian at, at all. Yeah. So I guess what happened then? Um, I assume it was at university that your view started to change? Yeah. Um, so I, um, well, I, yeah, I guess I arrived probably an agnostic. I wasn't particularly um, strong in my views either way. Um, 
And I went to, uh, in the very first week, I was invited to an event called Gorilla Christian, which I don't know if you've ever been to one. It's not anything to do with barbecuing. Um, but there were um, four Christians in a row, and they took questions on life, God, the universe, for about two hours. And I went to this, um, slightly intrigued, really. Uh, and about halfway through, I, I put my hand up and I asked a question. Surely you can't believe in God and be a scientist at the same time. And um, I was told, yes, you can. Um, these are actually answering very different questions that together are highly compatible. Um, and this was really a, a, a game changer for me. I'd never heard anything like this. It was a fairly straightforward answer, but it... It really set me on a new trajectory of asking a lot more questions and of grilling a lot more Christians. I had um, people uh, around me in my friendship groups that said they were Christians and were actually living in a way that seemed to match up with what they were saying. Um, and that was intriguing as well to me. Um, I watched how they lived and I asked them questions and I ended up moving in with three Christians in my second year and we had lots of conversations on the stairs late at night and um, all of those things that you have time to do when you're a student. Um, and I, I just I <coughs> weighed quite a lot of the evidence. There is quite a lot out there. It's not simply that we believe impossible things. Um, there is actually quite a lot of historical evidence. There's quite a lot of experiential evidence that I could say more about um, later if you want me to. Um, and I became convinced that not only was Jesus a man, but he was also God. And he also um, died a very significant death that took the weight of my wrongdoing upon himself, that he was, ha, had uh, willingly chosen to sort of carry the, this burden for me so that I could live f free from the guilt and shame that we often sort of carry around with us. And I became convinced that that was actually real and that it had happened. And the, the event that really verifies that it was real was that Jesus rose from the dead unlike any other person in history. And the evidence surrounding the resurrection was very persuasive to me. And so um, so I, this was about halfway through my degree in biochemistry um, that I um, put my trust in the person of Jesus. Okay. Um, yeah, there's a lot of questions to ask off the back of that. But I guess continuing on that theme, you, you, you clearly obviously do believe that science and belief in God are compatible. Um, and that's, it's, a common, it's a common idea that they're not. Um, faith and science can't come together. Um, I guess just what's, what's some of the more why you think they are compatible? Yeah. You mentioned them being separate, answering separate kind of questions almost yes. a minute ago. Yeah, I mean, the view that science and God are incompatible is... is kind of saying it's as though you have to choose. It's either science or God. It's either a scientific explanation or God did it. But that's a bit like asking somebody to choose between um, computer code and Mark Zuckerberg as the reasons that Facebook exists. And, of course, we think about that for a nanosecond and realize that those are two complementary explanations for Facebook, and one is describing the underlying mechanisms, and the other is describing the one whose idea it was and who um, set it all in motion and continues to uphold it today. And so there's, there's no logical um, conflict between the study of science and belief in God, because one is studying the world that arguably God made. Um, and, but he was the one that set it all in motion, whose idea it was, and continues to uphold it today. And, you know, my experience with my 15 years in science is that there are scientists who believe in God and there are scientists who don't. And the conflict isn't between science and God. It's actually based on the beliefs that you bring to your science. But there's nothing in the methodology or the practice of science that says 
this proves or disproves the existence of God. Those two things are entirely compatible. In fact, you could ask the question, you know, people assume that science is necessarily atheistic, that the presumed landscape of science is atheism. But is time plus matter plus chance enough to explain the two key things that enable the scientific method to go forwards? You know, um, one of those things is that there is order in nature. If you do a study here in Southampton and you go repeat it over in Bristol, what should you find? You should find the same results because there's an underlying order to the natural world without which science can't proceed. You can't repeat anything, you can't test anything. Well, where does that come from? And where does that come from if you're entrusting it all to a, a chance process? Does it make more sense that there is order in nature because there's an orderer behind it? And actually, C.S. Lewis uh, makes the point that it was actually belief in God that caused uh, many um, scientists during the modern scientific revolution to investigate nature. He says that men became scientific because they expected law in nature, and they expected law in nature because they believed in a law giver. It was precisely their belief in God that drove forward their science. And so there's order in nature, arguably, because there's an orderer behind it. And secondly, there's uh, how do you explain the order in the human mind? Um, you know, um, you know the, the, there are views out there, and this is behind the, the book that I have written um, on the human mind called Am I Just My Brain? Saying that, you know, you, you, your brain is, you are simply the neurons in your head. But if you are just the neurons in your head, then why would you trust any, anything it's outputting if it's all just chalked down to kind of chance, random processes? You know, this view deeply undermines the integrity of the mind that you have and the mind with which you pursue science. Does it not make more sense to say that we have a mind because there is a, a mind behind the universe uh, whose name is God? You know, the very first words in the Bible say, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. Could it be that we think because he does? And could it be that um, the scientific method is possible because the order in nature and the order in our human minds are both traceable to a rationally intelligent being known as God. And I, I, I think that's a really persuasive reason. Not only are these things compatible, but you can make a case that science makes a lot more sense if God exists than if he doesn't. Okay. Um, I'm going to come back to your book. Yeah. Um, uh, you have two books. One most recently, um, Am I Just My Brain? You've also actually written a book on suffering which I'd love to ask you about as well. Um, and maybe you'd like to ask some questions as well. Remember this paper and pens on your table. Um, but I guess just pushing back on that a bit, a lot of people would see kind of, oh, people, when they can't explain something by science, they say, oh, well, then God did it. Um, and, and so that would say that's really what you're doing with faith. It's just when you, something you don't understand you place God into that vacuum, almost. How would you mm. respond, respond to that? Yeah, I mean, I would come back to say that um, actually to, to be a scientist and to be studying the whole world is to say that the belief is that God is behind all of it. Um, but the nature of scientific explanation is to uncover <laughs> mechanisms. And I think, you know, scientists in the past have run into problems and back themselves into a corner by kind of saying that because there isn't a mechanism that we know about, God must have done it. But that's a God of the gaps notion that actually um, that's not what we're putting forward. We're saying God is behind all of it, but there are different levels of explanation. And so just because you come up with a, uh, a scientific mechanism doesn't in any way um, undermine the notion of God who who actually, you know, arguably is the one who set it in motion and is behind the whole of the cosmos and um, the, the, the world that we 
that we know. I mean, a classic example might be, you know, the Big Bang, that people think, well, you know, people used to say, well, God started, you know, the universe 14 billion years ago, but now we have this mechanism that shows that, you know, everything exploded and expanded from a singularity 14 billion years ago, and we, we don't need God now. Um, and, you know, we want to acknowledge the, the brilliance of that mechanism, the, uh, the, the understanding that it has brought to the evolution of the cosmos. Um, but there are still questions that it can't answer, um, that arguably science can, won't be able to answer. There are some questions that lie beyond the boundaries of science. You know, the, the Big Bang mechanism doesn't answer the question, why are we here at all? You know, why is there something rather than nothing? And why do I exist? And why is there something rather than nothing given the highly improbable conditions that were needed for that Big Bang at the very beginning? Highly, highly, highly improbable. How did that all line up and stack up to produce that singularity exploding into what we now see? And so I think it's really important to realize that there are questions that lie beyond the limits of science that science arguably will never be able to answer. And for those, we need philosophy and we need theology. Um, but what's really interesting about um, the Big Bang Theory is that it agrees actually with scripture that the universe had a beginning. And this is what the first verses of Genesis 1, verse 1 say, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. This is actually an example of a scientific discovery agreeing with the Judeo-Christian tradition. Thank you. Yeah. Um, well, it seems to be that you're saying that then faith is not just something without evidence, that it's not purely illogical. Um, sometimes people would say, well, you know, science, I just deal with facts, but faith is kind of just something you have to just trust. Um, how would you respond to that? Is, is faith just blind? No, this is a, a great question. Um, I think that if we take the face of meaning of faith, to be um, trust in something or someone. If we just think of it as putting our trust in something or someone, we quickly see that everyone has faith in something. We entrust ourselves to things and to people all the time. And we do so on the basis of evidence. So, you know, we, for example, we... You know, we might um, have a, a high level of trust in a, in a parent or a sibling because of the evidence of a lifetime of loyalty and love from them. And so our level of trust is proportional to the evidence to, to back it up. Or we might f lack trust in a person because they've let us down. But either way, the level of trust is based on the evidence and it's actually no different with the Christian faith. Uh, when people um, put their trust, put their faith in the person of Jesus in first century Palestine, it was not into this vacuum. It wasn't taking a blind leap into the dark and believing impossible things that had no bearing on life. It was actually, wow, here is a living, breathing person in front of me who lives like no one else I've ever seen, who says things I've never heard said like that before and with that authority, who treats people with such dignity and bucks all of the cultural trends of his day, and then seems to have this incredible capacity to heal and even raise people from the dead, and then goes on to raise from the dead himself. Um, and it was actually on the basis of all of that evidence that people put their trust in Jesus. It wasn't an irrational response. It, in some ways, it was the most rational thing they could do, having been persuaded that Jesus was the real deal and could be trusted. You know, we all, everyone has faith in something. The question is, is there good reason to justify what our faith is in? 
Now, I became persuaded, like many of those that I read about in the biographies of Jesus, that there is good reason to trust him with my life, with everything in my life. And, and actually, 20 years of following him has shown that to be even more true um, than, than even on the, the first day. Um, and so faith, what this has helped me to realize is that you can be a thinker and a person of faith. You can be a person of faith and someone who thinks. And that the challenge in front of us really um, is, have you weighed the evidence for Jesus? Um, arguably, it's the most important thing you could do with your life. Because if, if Jesus has risen from the dead and says that if we follow him, the same will be true of us, then this is the most important decision to make in your life. It says that death is not the end, that there is actually way more than just the natural world. Um, and actually, that was a process that I went through when I was uh, at Bristol. Um, and, yeah, that, that led me to the reality of a relationship, not just a, a religious concept, not just a set of traditions, but a person who is alive um, because they rose from the dead and wants to know me and walk with me through life. And maybe you'd like to ask uh, during the Q&A something about that, about evidence for the resurrection. Um, on that note, though, you, you've mentioned rising from the dead, you've mentioned miracles mm. for a bit. Um, miracles surely seem kind of anti-science. Is that right? Or? Well, um, it can seem like that at face value. Um, but actually, if we, if we dig a little deeper, we, um, we, we might see that uh, miracles actually require science in order to be identified. Um, so C.S. Lewis uses this example, which I'll kind of paraphrase from his book, Miracles. Um, he imagined that you are, I don't know, staying um, somewhere for a weekend and you're in a B&B &B and you leave um, a sort of bunch of cash in your bedside table. Imagine you leave, I don't know, a hundred pounds um, and you go out for the day uh, and you come back to your B&B &B and there's only 50 pounds in your bedside table. What do you conclude? Do you conclude that the laws of mathematics have been broken? Or do you conclude that the laws of England have been broken? It is precisely because the laws of mathematics are fixed and unchanging that you're able to recognize something else must have happened. Someone must have come in from outside and done something. You see, the laws of mathematics in no way contradict with the action of the thief. Rather, the laws of mathematics expose the actions of the, f the thief. And, and Lewis makes the point that there is no contradiction between miracles and, um, and, and uh, kind of thinking scientifically and logically. Because if God exists, then he would be able to create laws of nature that scientists investigate and uncover. But he would also be able to suspend those laws in order to do something extraordinary, like r raise someone from the dead. And it's because we understand the laws of nature that a miraculous intervention stands out when it happens. But these things are rare. And they happen not because God meddles with nature, but because he rescues. The stories that we read about in the biographies of Jesus are about a God who loves the people that he's made and has come to, to, to be with them face to face and then to defeat the ultimate enemy, the ultimate taboo, the thing that we all face one way or another, death. And he's come to, to stare that in the face and, and do something about it. And so this is all about a God not who asks us to believe irrational things, but a God who, if he exists, has, has created laws, but has occasionally suspended those to, to do something. And so to believe in miracles is not an irrational response 
to the world. It's a, actually an acknowledgement that there is more than just what I can see with my eyes. And I'm encouraged that one of the authors of um, the life of Jesus, Luke, wrote a gospel. And he was a physician. He was a medically trained man. And and that's reassuring to me. That And he wrote a highly ordered, systematic account. And as a scientist, I I feel really warm and fuzzy when I think about that because here's someone that is a really rigorous thinker who actually gathered data about Jesus and put it together in an orderly way so that you and I can make head and tail of this person. And he not only documents his teaching and his life, but also his miracles. He didn't seem to see it as a contradiction to his medical training, and that's reassuring to me as a scientist. Yeah, gathering data doesn't make me feel warm and fuzzy. For that is is that's helpful. It's true. Yeah, yeah, there are some differences. Um, let's talk about your um, most recent book. Am I just my brain? Um, that's quite a title. And why? What led you to to write? Yeah, a book with that title. Am I just my brain? Yeah. So um, yeah, the the reason that I wrote a book uh, with that title is because um, there are many questions being asked surrounding human identity today. What are we as human beings? Are we machines, as Richard Dawkins tried to tell me as a teenager? Are we, um, are we advanced apes? Are we souls confined to a body? What are we? Um, and this is really a question of identity. It's saying, you know, what is a human being? And there are some voices out there, both in the academic uh, arena and also at popular level, saying, you are your brain. You are the neurons in your head. And so the choices that you make, the behaviors you exhibit, even the religious beliefs that you hold, are all dictated and determined by the activity of your brain. And, um, and this is actually, you know, has quite wide-reaching implications. Um, if we are just our brains, then um, what does that mean? Does that mean that that has implications for free will? Um, do we actually make genuine choices or do we just do what our brains tell us? It has implications for ethics. Um, if is personhood dependent on having a fully functioning healthy brain? And if so, what do we do with those whose, whose brains are not fully developed, such as the unborn or those with degenerative diseases? Um, it also has implications for religious belief. Is religious belief all in the head and therefore not genuine? Um, and it has implications for AI. If we are just our brains, then we are machines that are replicable and one day we will be upgraded with a new, improved, inorganic version of ourselves. Maybe that's not an unattractive option for some of you and certainly not for me as the older I get. Um, but there are wide-reaching implications. This is not just a niche question. It's not just for the neuroscientist and philosopher, actually. It actually has huge, uh, hugely significant implications. And so I wanted to address this, uh, looking at the neuroscience and the philosophy and um, the um, theology as well. Okay. We've got about 10 minutes left. So I want to make sure we get to some specific questions at the end. But um, I have read your book. Um, and you argue that um, the kind of idea that just being your brain doesn't fully work. Could you share a little bit about that? Obviously, I don't want to, you to give away your whole book. But um, yeah, why, why do you think it, it, it doesn't fully work? Yes. Yeah. Um, so it's not enough simply to talk about the brain. So we have a brain, clearly. Um, I'm pretty sure we do. Um, with all of its neurons and chemical reactions and synapses and hormones and electrical activity. But we also have a mind with all of its thoughts and feelings and emotions and memories. 
And the million dollar question that lies at the heart of this whole conversation is what is the relationship between the brain and the mind? And this view that you are your brain is essentially saying there isn't really a mind, there's only a brain. Brain states are mental states, end of story. And there are lots of other positions out there. And what I try to do in the book is show, look, this is by no means a foregone conclusion. Um, and scientists have been discussing and debating this for centuries. And the impression is given sometimes that this is a, you know, this has been discovered and it's purely arisen through the rise of neuroscience and it's a, it's a done deal. But it's absolutely not. And there are many who don't believe in God who say, look, that is not the best way to describe the human person. Um, there is something that it is like to be you. You are a conscious being with an inner life. And the neuroscience and philosophy is showing that actually physical descriptions are not enough to account for what it is like to be you. Um, let me try and illustrate with, with uh, something. Uh, probably quite a lot of you like coffee. I like coffee. <clears throat> Imagine I ask you to describe to me the smell of coffee. Describe it in physical terms, because we're talking physical science, we're talking natural world. You should be able to describe the smell of coffee in a physical way to me. Well, you think about that for a moment and say, well, I can't. You actually need to smell it, and then you will understand. And offering me a, um, a diagram of the chemical structure of caffeine won't get me any closer to the smell of coffee. And what this helps us understand is that there are qualitative experiences of the world that cannot be accounted for using physical terms. There's a, there's a you that just describing your brain doesn't get at. And this is really what I try to unpack during, um, in this book by saying, look, there are lots of other ways of describing the relationship between the mind and the brain that make more sense of the human person than simply chalking it all down to blood flow changes, neurotransmitters, and that sort of thing. Thank you, yeah. And um, uh, again, if you want to write down a question, please do. We're going to be collecting them up in just a little bit. So if you want to write a question, do write it down and um, put it in a hat, or we'll come round as well and grab them from you. Um, so please do write down those questions. I guess um, a couple questions um, before we take a break, and then we have the Q&A. Um, but we've been, we've been talking a lot about um, uh, science and, and, and wrestling with these ideas. I guess on a more personal level for you, um, um, and uh, as a scientist, but also you know wider kind of, what does Jesus mean to you? What impact does he have on your life? Hmm. It's a big question. It's a big question. Um, he means everything. Um, he, he is the reason that I get up in the morning. He is the reason I keep um, taking a breath <laughs> every day. Um, he is um, the one that uh, gives me strength when it's uh, hard to, to figure out how that's going to happen, humanly speaking. He is the one that... Um, kind of leads me through life and not in a sense of um, obligation but on an adventure. I, I, I do um, think that actually um, to know uh, Jesus is to know myself better. There's often a, a sense that to, to be a Christian is somehow to become a lesser version of yourself, to somehow become less human and less engaged with the world. But actually I believe, Christians believe, that um, to, to put your trust in Jesus Christ, the author of life, is actually to become more yourself. It is to become happier in your skin. It is to become more in line and in tune with what you're made to do and who you're made to be. 
It is to become more yourself. And it's actually the stuff that we try and do without God that makes us less human, that makes us less of ourselves. To become a Christian, to, to walk with Jesus, is to become more engaged in the world, more relevant to the world, more caring about people, because we have um, the whole company of heaven. We have the resources of heaven walking with us. We have what is known as the Holy Spirit, which is the spirit of Jesus. And that's how he is alive today. That's why Christians talk about Jesus being alive, even though we can't see him and we can't um, look at him with our eyes, but he is with us by the Holy Spirit. And this is part of um, God who has been around since the very beginning, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And so he is everything. He is my beginning and he will be my end and he will carry me through death into eternal life with him. Um, so obviously here this evening, um, there are people who are Christians and maybe have been for a long time. There are people who are really skeptical, to be honest. Um, uh, about the whole idea of faith, God, Jesus, um, and people maybe who are really questioning and, and searching and in investigating into this. Um, I guess what would be your kind of um, final thoughts to them, your encouragement to them? Um, if you... I would say that... Um, so if something is true, um, it, it's going to hold water... Uh, no matter how hard you press, no matter how hard the question is that you ask, if it's true, you don't need to worry about asking a hard question because it will still stand up underneath. If it's not true, it will collapse and won't bear the weight of your question. Um, and so I would encourage you to ask your questions, make the most of this series and the events going on at Above Bar and indeed in many of the churches um, around here. Um, I would encourage you to read for yourself one of the biographies of Jesus. If you've never read it, read it for yourself. Don't take um, the opinion of someone else as gospel, <laughs> as it were. Um, read for yourself, weigh it and test it. Be scientific, look at the raw data yourself. And I would say, are you open to new ideas? You know, at the heart of being a good scientist requires the need to be open to new ideas. How does the scientific, um, how does the scientific uh, study progress? Well, you start with a hypothesis you collect data, you ask, okay, does the data agree with the starting hypothesis? If it does, great, you collect more, you go on. But if it doesn't, you have to be open to saying, look, did I have the right idea in the first place? We need to be open to new ideas. And we know that the progress of science can be helped or hindered depending on the scientist's openness to whether they got it wrong in the first place. And so I ask you, as a scientist, to those who are interested in science, are you open to new ideas? Because if, if Jesus raised, was raised from the dead, it's not just something that's true for religious people and not for others. It's either true for all of us or true for none of us. And so it really, really matters. So I would encourage you to ask your questions Look at the raw data for yourself. And, um, and, you know, if you're open to the God, if you're out there, show me, then that's a really, that's a kind of a starting prayer that, that can be helpful, that people have found helpful on their journey. Oh, there's um, so many more questions I'd love to ask, and hopefully we can ask them uh, during the Q&A. But... Um, Sharon, thank you so much uh, for sharing from your experiences and also from yeah, your scientific background. It's been really helpful. Can we give her a round of applause? Yeah.
We're going to take a 10-minute break now, um, so if you want to get another drink or maybe some more food, use the loo, that kind of thing, I'm going to come around and gather up questions, and in 10 minutes, uh, we'll have about 20 minutes of Q&A to wrap up the evening. Great. It was very important to me that reason was attached to my faith. I saw this book on my grandmother's bookshelf called Jesus Among Other Gods. And in, in the book, the bottom of the page, it says, faith is not bereft of reason. And that phrase literally changed my whole paradigm of Christianity. It was very important to me that reason was attached to my faith. I saw this book on my grandmother's bookshelf called Jesus Among Other Gods. And in, in the book, the bottom of the page, it says, faith is not bereft of reason. And that phrase literally changed my whole paradigm of Christianity. It was very important to me that reason was attached to my faith. I saw this book on my grandmother's bookshelf called Jesus Among Other Gods. And in, in the book, the bottom of the page, it says, faith is not bereft of reason. And that phrase literally changed my whole paradigm of Christianity.
it was very important to me that reason was attached to my faith. I saw this book on my grandmother's bookshelf called Jesus Among Other Gods. And in, in the book, the bottom of the page, it says, faith is not bereft of reason. And that phrase literally changed my whole paradigm of Christianity. It was very important to me that reason was attached to my faith. I saw this book on my grandmother's bookshelf called Jesus Among Other Gods. And in, in the book, the bottom of the page, it says, faith is not bereft of reason. And that phrase literally changed my whole paradigm of Christianity. It was very important to me that reason was attached to my faith. I saw this book on my grandmother's bookshelf called Jesus Among Other Gods. And in, in the book, the bottom of the page, it says, faith is not bereft of reason. And that phrase literally changed my whole paradigm of Christianity. It was very important to me that reason was attached to my faith. I saw this book on my grandmother's bookshelf called Jesus Among Other Gods. And in, in the book, the bottom of the page, it says, faith is not bereft of reason. And that phrase literally changed my whole paradigm of Christianity. It was very important to me that reason was attached to my faith. I saw this book on my grandmother's bookshelf called Jesus Among Other Gods. And in, in the book, the bottom of the page, it says, faith is not bereft of reason. And that phrase 
literally changed my whole paradigm of Christianity. It was very important to me that reason was attached to my faith. I saw this book on my grandmother's bookshelf called Jesus Among Other Gods. And in, in the book, at the bottom of the page, it says, faith is not bereft of reason. And that phrase literally changed my whole paradigm of Christianity. It was very important to me that reason was attached to my faith. I saw this book on my grandmother's bookshelf called Jesus Among Other Gods. And in, in the book, at the bottom of the page, it says, faith is not bereft of reason. And that phrase literally changed my whole paradigm of Christianity. Okay, okay. We're going to um, start the Q&A. I have to say, first of all, with an apology, there are so many questions in this hat, there is no way we're going to get through all of them. Um, Sharon is willing to stick around for a little while afterwards to, to chat with people and ask their questions. So maybe if your question gets answered during this Q&A, let somebody else go and, and chat with Sharon afterwards. Um, but we're gonna, we, we try to look through them and see if there are certain ones that are asked multiple times, and if a lot of people are asking that question to give them preference. So I apologize if yours isn't asked, but we're gonna go for it. Okay. Um, this first one is, what would it take for you to set aside your faith? If you're asking others to be open to Christianity, are you open to atheism? Yeah, thank you for the question. And um, this is a great question. I think it's really important um, to ask it. I, I guess my story is that I was open to atheism before I was open to Christianity. Um, so I have already been on that side of belief where I didn't believe that God existed. I wouldn't say I was an overt atheist, but I was an agnostic. And I beca became persuaded that there was more to this life. And, and actually, t this question is asking, am I open to the possibility that there is less to this life than I have currently experienced over the last 20 years? And I have to say that I've only become more convinced of um, the reality of God over the last 20 years. One of the ways is through um, answered prayer. 
Um, I like to see this, uh, I think, quite scientifically about this. When I was a very new Christian and I was sort of praying and some of my very specific prayers were answered, you could say, well, that's just a coincidence, you know. Um, you prayed to the four walls and something happened. And, and I, I say that's fair enough. Um, but after 20 years... Um, and, and seeing things be answered that, that kind of logically speaking and in human terms see them be answered, um, I, I can't just put that down to coincidence. And actually it was uh, a former Archbishop of Canterbury that said when we pray coincidences happen and when we don't, they don't. And, and um, I, I guess you're asking me to sort of give up my right arm by, by asking the question. You know, it's part of me, and I, I have a, like 20 years of data points that are un, unequivocal as far as I'm concerned. Now, obviously, you have to discover that for yourself, but I, I'm actually not in a position where I either want to or I'm even intellectually or existentially persuaded to go back to the view that I am in a chance plus time plus matter universe, that my life means nothing to anyone, and I should just live for the moment, and that's it, and, and death is the end when you die. I'm just not persuaded that that makes sense of humanity, of, of our longing for meaning, our longing for relationship. Um, and so I'm not, I'm not persuaded by, by that view. Um, I guess it, uh, theoretically I'm open, but I'm not persuaded. I'm persuaded by the reality that, that God exists, that he loves the people that he's made and he's made us all for a life of meaning and purpose. Great. Okay, thank you. Um, before I jump into this next one, Paul, could you grab me an uncover mark from back there? Sorry, I forgot to bring it up with me with all these questions. There's a lot of questions here about souls and the mind. Um, I'm going to read a couple to you and then let you um, go for it. Um, the first one is short. Theoretically, could clones have souls? And then this one is a bit longer. Uh, deep minds, alpha zero, can be anyone, um, and it can learn any game to world-class level by playing itself. But will it ever be able to taste coffee? Yeah, and that is a great question. And this is, you know, one of the... Um, really um, at the heart of one of the, the biggest questions that we are facing today. And we've all benefited from AI in all kinds of ways, and it's a great thing. Um, in this whole conversation, we need to distinguish between information processing capacity and human consciousness, that sense of having an inner self, that there is something that it is to be me and you that we experience the world from, from our first-person vantage point. And, of course, um, what you believe about the relation, relationship between the mind and the brain influences what you believe will be possible with AI. Um, you know, if you believe that, that, that we are just machines, then arguably, eventually... Um, we will, uh, there will be androids that can do all of the things that we can do and be conscious in the same way that we are. But if you believe that there is more to a person, that there is actually a non-physical component to a person as well, then even uh, the most complex and developed android or algorithm will never be conscious. It will be able to process information in incredible ways, but it will never display human levels of consciousness. And even Deep Minds Alpha Zero, that's an example of machine learning where an algorithm is able to adapt and change. But that's only because a human being, a rationally intelligent being, has inputted a whole body of information into that algorithm in the first place. And these things are only arising because conscious human beings are developing them and so that I, I would argue that there is something unique about humanity that will never be replicated um, artificially e even though there's much to be grateful for in the technology of AI Great. okay mm. the next one is do you believe the Bible in its entirety is compatible 
with scientific explanations. Thank you. Um, the thing that's incredible about the Bible is that it is not a one-size-fits-all flat book that is simply to be read and kind of um, regurgitated. Um, the Bible is an incredible piece of literature, but there are many different types of literature. It's a book that's written over a span of thousands of years with, over, with uh, you know, hundreds of different authors ranging from lots of different demographic groups from kind of uh, farmers up to royalty. Um, and it's got lots of different types of literature. There are lots of genre of literature. There are eyewitness accounts that I've been talking to you about tonight, people that saw Jesus with their eyes. There's also, um, there are songs, that's what the Psalms are about. Um, there are saying, why sayings, that's what the book of Proverbs is about. There's apocalyptic literature about en the end of um, time. And that's what the very last book, Revelation, is about. And then there's creative um, writing right at the beginning in Genesis. And so when we come to the Bible, in order to best understand what God is saying through these human authors in all of these different styles, ways is to recognize what the type of writing is. And so and that, that's actually really uh, interesting um, it's an incredible book. There's nothing else like it out there, and it's actually still the world's bestseller. Um, and and in, in this question, uh, is the Bible in its entirety compatible with scientific explanation? I would say yes, in the same way that I've said earlier in my talk, that actually the kind of um, issues that the Bible is addressing are, are, they're not scientific primarily. Genesis 1 is not a scientific document describing how the universe and the, the world and how biological life came to be. It's a poetic, creative story about things that really happened, but not in a chronological, scientific manner. It's, it's actually written into a polytheistic culture where they um, believe that there are gods of wind and fire and... And, and, and rain and everything else. And the author of Genesis is writing to say, look, it's not really about the how or the when or even the how long ago. It's actually about the who of creation. There's only one God. Nature is not God. God made the natural world, and he is distinct from it. Uh, and so because of that... But the, the Bible and scientific discovery, again, they're answering different kinds of questions in very different ways. And because of that, they're entirely compatible. And so you can read the Bible as a scientist, and you can be a scientist and love reading the Bible and not uh, come up with a, a conflict there. Okay. Um, this is changing gears a bit. You've also written a book called Why? That's on suffering. Uh, this question says, how does a scientist, doctor, deal with a patient with a terminal illness? Do they offer prayer or hope of a miracle? Thank you um, for the question. Um, and this is changing gear. And, um, you know, I, I, I wrote the, the book. Uh, I wrote it. I felt actually God was asking me to write a book about suffering before I started to think about anything to do with science because I think this is the hardest question of all and I think it's the biggest barrier to faith where people, um, you know, would say, oh, look, if God is real, surely he would not have let that happen. And there are all kinds of things that I could say to this question. If you are interested, if this is a a live issue for you, if this is a question you're wrestling with, I'd love to give you a copy of my book uh, at no charge. Um, I'll, I'll be over by the books later, so I'm not going to try and dive in to this huge area um, with just a couple of minutes because almost everything I say will be an oversimplification, except to say that at the heart of the Christian faith is a God who has suffered um, you know, Christians talk about and um, walk around with crucifixes 
around their necks. This is like wearing a guillotine or an electric chair. It's an instrument of torture. It's an instrument of horrific torture. And Jesus died on this cross. Um, this was a way that the Romans had of killing people that was... It, there hasn't been a worse method of putting someone to death that has arisen in, in the whole of human history. And this is the way that Jesus died. Um, he entered human history to look hurting people in the eye and do something about their suffering. And we read about that in, in the biographies of his life. But he also went on to suffer like us. He suffered on the cross. He was deserted by his friends. He was betrayed by one of his closest friends. He was beaten up by a battalion of soldiers. He was nailed to a cross. There was physical suffering. There was psychological suffering. Um, and, and yet, um, the worst level of his suffering was something that we can't probably get our head around and we can't even depict it in the movies that attempt to capture this event. You see, when Jesus was on the cross, he was um, willingly carrying the, the evil of the world on his shoulders. All of the world's evil was directed at one target, the one person who themselves carried no evil and didn't contribute to the problem of suffering. And Jesus um, was entirely alone carrying the weight of the world on his shoulders during his time of worst suffering so that you and I never have to be alone carrying the weight of the world on our shoulders during our time of worst suffering. He said he was willing to die so that we can live. And somehow there's an exchange that took place in that historic event. And this is at the heart of, 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 of how we try to respond to this question, that it, whatever life has thrown at you, Jesus says to you, you can go through it without me or with me. But with me, there is strength you never knew that you had. There is forgiveness for the shame and guilt that you feel. And there is hope for the future. There is a way to lift your head and walk another day with God, who has suffered, who knows what it's like, and says, walk with me. Do this with me. And that has been my story. Um, the book that I wrote uh, was written out of uh, my husband having a, an illness that doesn't even have a name. Um, and medics don't properly understand what's wrong with him, and it comes and goes through life. And, and actually, this is my reality. This is my story, that I know that God is real, that he walks with me through the valleys that life throws at us and gives us hope for another day. And so that is the backdrop. That is the kind of thing that I talk about in, in my book. And so how does a scientist or doctor deal with a patient with a terminal illness? I think this is where, you know, the view, if you are just your brain, if the natural world is all that there is, then all you can do is medicate. Treat the physical. But if there's more to a person than simply what's happening to their body, then there's more that we can do. Um, if, we have a, if it's true that we have genuinely such a thing as a mind, then, we can, th then things like counselling and therapy will be helpful to the person as well, as well as medicating and, and whatever help um, modern medicine can, can um, give. And then if the actually there's more beyond that, that we actually are a spiritual being, then yes, we can pray for that person and know that that prayer is not simply the f to the four walls, but it does make a difference. It is heard by God. And um, I don't think it's wrong to pray for a miracle if that person is open for you to pray for that. But in doing so, we have to recognize that um, when uh, Jesus walked the earth, he said that the kingdom of heaven is here. And they saw miraculous things happen because things of heaven had broken into human history with the arrival of Jesus. But at the same time, um, not all sickness and death has been taken away yet. And so if we pray for healing, if we pray for a miracle and it happens, that is a reminder 
that the kingdom of heaven has broken in and extraordinary things are possible and they are a glimpse of what one day will be reality for everybody. But if we pray for a miracle and it doesn't happen, that doesn't mean you didn't pray enough. It doesn't mean you didn't have enough faith. It doesn't mean God is punishing you because you need to learn something that no one else does. It didn't happen because evil and suffering hasn't yet been removed. Um, and, and, but one day it will. That is the Christian story, that it has been defeated. And one day there will be no more crying and suffering and pain. And in that sense, God will do the miraculous for everyone that chooses him in this life. And he will do extraordinary things on that day. And that's a really, really broad answer to a very deep question. Thank you for asking. Thank you, Sharon. I think we need to stop. Um, we, um, there, are more, there are so many good questions in here. These are really great questions. I think, Sharon, we're just going to have to have you back. Are you free on Friday night, actually? <laughs> be good. Um, but genuinely, um, if, if your question wasn't answered, um, maybe you'd like to chat um, with Sharon afterwards. I'm happy to stick around and chat as well. Um, uh, I would encourage you, if, you're, if your question wasn't answered, I apologize, but don't um, stop there. We'd love to engage with you. We'd love to, to chat with you. We'd love to wrestle with that question. Um, just also to say, Sharon, um, in the interview, kind of encouraged people to, to investigate and to look at Jesus for themselves. And um, if, if you would like to, if that's something you would like to do, we'd love to offer you uh, this. It's called Uncover Mark. It's one of the eyewitness accounts, one of the Gospels um, about Jesus' life, um, Mark, and um, in this beautiful little book. But it also has, in the middle of it, um, questions that you can ask um, uh, on different passages in, in Mark's Gospel. And you could look at with somebody and explore it side by side over, over a lovely cocktail or over coffee or at McDonald's or wherever you want to. And it gives historical context. It gives links to videos you could watch to, to help you wrestle with and, and explore further for yourself. If that's something you would be interested in doing, you'd like to just, hey, why not? It's worth investigating, at least. Um, please come and see me. We'd love for you to have one of these. Um, we have one more night of Real Lives this week. Tomorrow night, uh, we have an actor who's traveled all the way from New York City, Warner Miller who has um, been in Netflix's Luke Cage and American Gangster with Denzel Washington, among other things. He's going to be sharing about his life, his journey to faith, what it's like in the acting world, um, and um, also his wrestling with um, making sense what he believes in his heart, making sense in his mind. So it's going to be fantastic. Um, thank you so much for coming. Could we give two rounds of applause? One to the wonderful staff here at Revolution de Cuba. It's been a wonderful night, and it's a wonderful venue, and we're really appreciative of that. <laughs> and also, again, um, to Dr. Sharon Dirks. Thank you so much, Sharon. Enjoy your evening. Um, Sharon's books, if you would be interested.